This workshop was recorded on April 17, 2021. My name is Adriana Pickerell. I am an assistant professor of data science at University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona, the United States. Uh, I know it's not morning for everyone. Uh, it is morning for me. Um, so this is again the link that we're gonna be following along. Uh, if you go to my website, which is just pickerell.github.io, you have, um, the links to all the other workshops that I've um, given and written about. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about quantitative language analysis and visualization in R. Um, and like I was mentioning before, for people who are already here, um, you should have uh, R and R studio installed uh, in your computer. It'll be easier for you to follow along. Um, you can use R Studio Cloud as well. You can create a, a free account in R Studio Cloud. If you, for some reason, cannot install anything in your computer, for example. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll move this website to the side so I can show you how to start uh, and follow along. Uh, but please refer to this um, at any point. You can copy and paste uh, if you want to. So let me move this aside. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to create a folder in my desktop. And I'm going to give it a name that is meaningful to me. I'm going to do Crow Workshop for um just the goal mm. i'll say life demonstration um so you name your folder whatever <laughs> you want as long as you know what it is and how to find it um and then the next thing i'm going to do actually is download the data that we're going to be working with uh today before we install this so today we're going to work with um variables that uh that data from Douglas munch's book Variation is social linguistics. I have the book right here. Highly recommend uh, reading this book, especially chapter five. Uh, so the reason we're using this data is because uh, it's public and we can check the results against uh, what Tagle Monti wrote about. Uh, so there is a link and I'm gonna share this link. Um, I'm recording, so I'm recording the meeting. And I will send you a link after um, next week after this workshop. So, all right, so data. I'm going to click on this, but I can also share. I'm going to share this link with you. You do have that link in the materials. Um, so, this is where you'll find the data. So, it's a zip file. I'm going to unzip it. I have so many um, data dots it. I'm going to unzip it. Uh, and then that creates a data folder. I'm going to open my folder again, where that I created in my desktop. I'm just going to move that data um, to my uh, folder. If you are using R Studio, let me give instructions first for regular R Studio not R Studio Cloud. So I'm gonna open my R Studio, which I don't have it open. I have opened with other stuff. Um, so when you open R Studio, this is what it looks like. Let me actually, my R Studio Cloud is gonna look a little bit different than yours because I already have projects. But this is what it looks like when you go to projects in R Studio Cloud. I always work with projects. Uh, so that's why I create the folder with the data folder inside uh, because I have so many projects, right? So you have to make sure that you're organizing your folders and your data in the same place. Uh, so you don't have to match your script with your data and you, where the data is, right? Uh, so I'll, I'll always follow these steps. So once you open your R Studio, 
Let me make this a little bigger so you can see a little better. What you're gonna do if you have our studio desktop, you go file, new project. I, I created a folder, so I don't have a directory there. So I'm gonna click on existing directory. And then I'm gonna click to browse to find that directory I just created in my, uh, in my desktop, which I called Pro Workshops or Serial for excuse me, live demo. So I'm gonna click open. So that folder I created in my desktop now is gonna be my project. I'm gonna say create project. And once I do, you're gonna see here in the files panel, the panel to on the bottom right that I have my data folder there, which is the folder I created. Uh, let me give instructions on our studio for uh, cloud for people who are using our studio cloud. Uh, so if, when you log into an account and you are in projects, uh, you can click new project. It's gonna deploy, you can give it a name. And then once it opens, it's gonna look very similar to what I just had right here, very similar. But again, and then you don't need to um, download uh, or install anything to your computer. I'm gonna create a new folder. So I'm gonna click on this uh, bottom right panel with new folder. I'm gonna create a folder called data. And then inside of this folder, I just clicked on it. I'm gonna upload those files in my computer, right? They do upload just file. Um, desktop, crow for line in data. Can I just more than one file? No, I have to do one file at a time. Uh, upload, choose file, and then individual data. I'll be talking about these data files in a minute. But this is how you set up the project in R Studio Cloud. From here on, it's basically exactly the same. You can close this window and it's exactly the same. So I'm gonna put this aside and work on my RStudio uh, desktop. Okay, so I have my data, I have my project. I'm gonna create a new R script. So I'm gonna click on new file. Uh, there is a, the first icon on the top left or you can go file, new file, R script. This is where I'm going to be typing all of the my instructions or commands. Uh, so it's going to be saved as a as a, a script, so I can rerun in the future. I'm going to save this as I'm going to do just one. So I'm going to say data analysis, data wrangling, and analysis and visualization. I usually have separate scripts for each one of these stages. All right, so now I have my script. Uh, yes, I'm gonna, for everyone asking for the recording, yes, uh, I'm gonna make the recording available after this workshop during the week. I'm gonna send you an email. Could not find upload. Okay, so there is no upload in your RStudio cloud, right? Not RStudio desktop, I was just showing. Uh, this for people who, uh, let me just repeat. For our Studio Cloud, there is no upload button. For our Studio Desktop, there is no upload. So if you're using our Studio Desktop installed in your computer, then there is no upload button. The upload is just for people using our Studio Cloud. Uh, the data link, I'm gonna send you again. Copy link address. So you, if you're just using RStudio in your own computer, download the data and just put the data folder in uh, your project folder. So this is RStudio desktop if it's installed in your computer. 
but some people cannot install stuff on their computer. A lot of people actually. Then they use our Studio Cloud. All right. I will just start by loading libraries. Uh, we're be work we're going to be working with two libraries today. Um, we're going to be working with Tidyverse and Effects. So for people asking about the data, what I just do is just I put the data folder inside the folder that I created in my desktop. Right, so I have, I created this Scrum Workshop 4, and then my data folder is just inside that folder. I just drag and drop, right? <laughs> All right, so libraries. Um, we're going to install and load the libraries. I already have these libraries installed, uh, but I have the instructions here. And usually what happens now with our studio is that uh, you can just type, if you're, you have your R script, and if you just type library tidyverse and type library effects, and you save your script, you're gonna get a message, a yellow bar saying, uh, if you don't have these installed, it's, there will be an install link for you and then it's gonna install for you. And then it's gonna do the installation. If you don't get the message, you can install um, packages where the instructions are provided here. So I just do install packages and the package name has to go between quotes. So you do install packages tidyverse and install packages um, effects. To run this, I just typed nothing ran, right? My console here is empty. To run each one of these, you can click on the run button and that's gonna run that line. Not tidy text. Um, so I fixed in the instructions. So you don't, if you don't see tidyverse in the instructions, you have to do a reload or force reload. So refresh basically this page. I had, uh, yeah, I had written the wrong. I do use tidy text, but um, so it takes a while to install tidyverse and then also install tidy text. Gonna notice that I do the pound sign uh, for comments. I'm gonna comment these two out because you don't need to install these packages every time you run the script. You just need to install them once. And then once you have them installed, I can run this. I can run this line. I can click on run to to run it. You see, like stuff shows up in your console when you run things, right? Uh, and also the way I do it, you're gonna see me doing is that I do, uh, I'm on a Mac, I do command enter to run. It has the same effect as clicking on the run button. Uh, on a Windows computer, you do control enter. All right. So we have our packages loaded. Let's read data in. So the data, like I mentioned, I put the data in my data folder inside my um, my project folder. And it's right here. Uh, I can see it, the data folder inside uh, in the files, uh, the, the bottom right panel, right? So I click on it. I'm gonna see the two files that I have um, that I downloaded from that zip file and then zipped it. So now today, the two files, I'm gonna call it the same as I have here. Uh, so this is complement, it's verb complement data. We're gonna be sure, uh, we're talking about it in a minute. I'm gonna create an object uh, or a data frame called complement that data. I'm gonna assign to it the read, I'm gonna read the CSV. And I, I do read underscore CSV, not read dot CSV, they're different functions. And then you specify in the read CSV where your data is. 
my data and I expect your data to be inside the data folder. And be, uh, it's called complement that data.csv. So I typed it, I'm gonna run it. Uh, notice how my environment is empty. But once I run this command enter, uh, my, my global environment, I'll have the complement that data. I'm also gonna read in the individual data with the same command, read underscore CSV between quotes. I specify where my data is. It's inside the data folder and it's called individual data.csv. And then I ran with command enter. So once you do that, you have, you should have two data objects of data frames in your global environment. And if you click on them anywhere, um, except this little blue button here, but anywhere you click on it is gonna open the data frame in a different uh, tab in your R Studio. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the data. So these are um, occurrences, our individual occurrences, also uh, known as tokens, um, not in the way corpus linguists talk about tokens, but the way that um, variationists or sociolinguists talk about uh, tokens. So it's one, one observation of a, that uh, a verb complement clause. So we're gonna, you're gonna see that we have whether that is, is expressed or not or omitted. When I click, if you click on the on the header, it's of sorts. So it's a binary variable. Either that is there or it's not there. And then you have what the verb is. Sorry, there is an error. Make sure that you run library tidyverse for that error admon. Um, you have what is the subject of the matrix clause? If there is any additional element between um, that, uh, the verb and that. Um, the in the matrix, right? The verb in the matrix and the complementizer, the subject of the subordinate clause, uh, the tense, and then the individual. So there is an individual code, right? There is a name for the individual. And then here you have the context of that complement clause. But in a way, they, they drove back. And ooh, this is kind of like, where is the, they seem to have kind of the view that, okay, so this, this first context is kind of weird. I mean, okay, here it's some one that is, I don't know how people enter the context, but I think it's still a school. People can say, I think that is a still school, right? So this, that, the, that is omitted. Um, and the second one and that probably, the, we don't have the whole context here but the, that is here. So that's the difference, right? So in verb complement clauses, there can be uh, the that complementizer can be omitted or not. And basically you, you have all these sociolinguistics interviews with these individuals. And then for every instance of a verb complement clause, this was coded. This is tidy data. You have one observation per line. Uh, there was a question in the chat about the column names. The column names come for, from the my file. So if I go to the folder and I look at my data, I've complement that data, it's gonna be very small. I don't know if I can make it this bigger, but these column names come from my data file. So the column of specification comes from the data. So the column names are in the data file. So whenever you get 
something not found, that means you don't have that in your global environment, right? So, so if you notice that my, my global environment, uh, I have comp, I can do this, right? This is, I use autocomplete a lot. The autocomplete tells you one, you have that object in your global environment. I mean, I ran line 10, right? Uh, and two, I don't have to type and make uh, typos. So if I just type the name of my data, I get the data. If I have a typo here, I'm gonna get object not found because I don't have this object, right? So whenever you get uh, this error, that means you haven't created this object. So for the, some of the people who, the person who got complement data not found, make sure that you ran this line and that you have that object in your data. If the read CSV function is not working for you, that means you didn't run library diverse. So just make sure you run this line and then your read CSV is gonna work. You can name your objects whatever you want, right? This is up to you, as long as you use these names um, later on. So the point I make here is that this is the this is a good example on how to organize the data, and I do that for everything that um, for all types of data I collect. Like if I'm doing lexical bundles, I do one one each row in my data is one observation of one lexical bundle bundle occurring in uh, a specific text, right? So basically, have each row is one observation. Um, what is the difference between read.csv and read underscore csv? Read.csv is from base R, I believe. Let me see. If I'm going to go to my console and type question mark read.csv. Um, oh, it's from utils, which is, so this is um, a function from a different package. And then if I do question mark read underscore CSV, you're gonna see that this is a function from read, read R, which is uh, from tidyverse. I prefer read.csv because it does some formatting for me. Like it, it does like the dates, uh, it just do, it does more things. Um, uh, also the column names, the way it reads them is often is different. So I tell you to use whatever I'm using because uh, if you're typing along, with me, then it matches. But also this is the function I prefer to use. You can use read.csv, but kind of a personal preference. All right, so just a reminder that tidy data uh, is each row in the data is a single observation. In this case, in our data, a single observation is an occurrence of that co verb complement clause uh, in all of these sociolinguistic interviews. And each column is a single variable. Uh, let's look at the individual data for the participants. So you notice that in the complement that data, we do have the individual here. It's like where, who said this, right? Uh, if I look at the individual data, if I click on it, then I have the individual. Uh, so this is a code or a synonym, right? Is female, older? That's the, the age, white collar, and education up to minimum age. So it's nice to keep your, also your data with your observations separate from your data on participants, right? I have 32 participants here. Um, all right, so these are the two data files. Um, you're often gonna see In, when people are reporting things, um, how many participants you have in each groups, for example. And you can easily get that from this type of data. So I'm gonna type uh, my data for individuals, which is individual data, and I'm gonna do a pipe, uh, which is the 
this is called, let me make a comment, a pipe. Um, it's a percentage greater than percentage combination is a symbol, meaning, and then. Uh, the shortcut, I never used the shortcut, I believe is uh, command or control if we're on a Windows plus shift plus M. That creates the pipe. I usually just type it in. So if I get my individual data and then I count. So remember that my individual data, I'm going to click on the top again, uh, has all these um, social variables, right? It has like, for example, sex and age category. So if I count these two variables, sex and age, um, and I run, I do command enter, I'm gonna see how this, uh, how my participants is, are distributed in the different groups. It seems like they're pretty kind of evenly distributed. Uh, it does seem that we have more male or man, um, middle, age like middle in my age bracket from 36 to 65. So I have eight participants in that uh, in these groups. Um, so what my point before that is that if you do have the data organized in this way, you can always get the count, but you can never get the individuals observing or individual observations from the counts, right? So whenever you're organizing your data or collecting data, make sure that you have one observation per row so you can create the counts later. Uh, so you can do this, of course, with any, uh, we can count any of the numeric variables. So for example, I can do individual data, um, and then I can count, let's count education and occupation. Let me run this. So usually also, this is a very um, tidy way to, to display data. Um, usually in these tables, I'm gonna add something else here. You're gonna see the table usually is distributed in this way. I'm gonna do a pivot wider to show you how you usually see data in papers and so on. I'm gonna do my names from, um, let's do education. So that means I'm gonna make education into a column and my values from N and I'm just gonna run. So I just added uh, another function here. And then if I run this, I get, a table that it, we usually see normally in papers, right? Uh, so I have a blue collar, more than minimum age, one person, blue collar up to minimum age, 11 people, white collar for more than minimum age, I have 10 and 10 for up to minimum age for education, right? Remember this is education, uh, 10 participants in that category, that cross tab. This is usually called a cross tab, the reason you do these cross tabs uh, is to look at any correlations, right? So correlation means when your data is basically the same, uh, your variables, two variables that are measuring basically the same thing. Um, so in this one, it seems to be very, fairly well distributed, especially except for this one. So in general, like you have to be careful with stuff like occupation and education because they are related, right? If I had uh, all of my participants in more than minimum age for education, that means past, you know, whatever the minimum age, past high school. Um, and so if you have all the participants in more than minimum age and white collar, and you had zero participants here, and you had all participants in blue collar up to minimum age, that means that they didn't go, they didn't have schooling more than what the minimum age for schooling is. If you had all participants here and zero here, that means that your occupation variable 
measures exactly what education is measuring, right? So they perfectly correlate. And whenever they're perfectly correlated, you cannot add them to your regression. You have to choose one of them because they're the same variable. All right, thank you, Larissa, for, for having me around. So like, okay, so correlation is when you have two variables that measure the same thing. Uh, in this case, I am a little worried there is just one person that is a blue collar worker and they, ha they, they have more than, than the minimum age education. Uh, so I'm guessing that like Lemonti was not able to find a blue collar or worker that had more than high school, that had college education, which I guess makes sense. Uh, but then like up to minimum age, people with college degrees or more than college degrees uh, are kind of well distributed between blue and white collar. Um, okay, so again, make sure that you have your data, one observation per row so you can get the counts. Never get just the counts from whatever data collection you're doing. Yes, SQL, yes, this is a uh, tidyverse, um, is based on SQL sequence, sorry, syntax. <laughs> yeah, SQL and tidyverse are very, are very, that's why I like it so much. All right, so that is the concept of correlation. We're going to be talking about in, uh, interaction in a bit. So let's start, now that we have our data loaded, um, let's start by doing some data analysis. So the idea here, uh, in case you have never read Tagliamonti's book, is that verb complement clauses, uh, the omission or not of that, I say, I think it's a school versus I think that it's a school, shows variation in terms of linguistic uh, context or the variables like the verb and uh, other aspects of the linguistic structure of the sentence, but also it shows variation of that omission or not, or that express in terms of social variables or groups, right? Certain groups of people prefer to not omit that, while other groups, uh, they have the more of a tendency to omit that. And of course, there's a number of factors, whether it's a standard use or, People want to be perceived as more educated, educated and so on. So we're going to be looking at the rate of omission of that complementizers in verb complement clauses. Uh, so let's start with, I'm gonna make a comment uh, just to separate my, organize my, my script here. I'm gonna say, let's start at uh, analyzing that omission rate by participant. So let's look at the social factors first, because they are a little bit easier in terms of grouping because I have one individual has, if they are, well, sex, gender shouldn't be binary, right? But it is binary in this data. Uh, so one individual is either male or female and they have a certain age and they belong to a certain social group, right? Um, so let's do, let's calculate per participant, uh, what's the rate of omission from all the, the verb complement clauses? Uh, what's the percentage of these uh, that they didn't use the that complementizer? So to do that, um, we're going to start with that individual, sorry, not individual data, sorry, the complement that data. We're gonna use the individual data later. So the complement that data has each instance of a, a verb complement clauses by each person. And then it tells me if the that was omitted or it was expressed, right? So basically what we want to do here is to account of how many that omitted and how many that expressed we have per individual. So I want to count dependent variable which is a binary variable and um, individual. So let's do that. So I'm gonna do it then. I'm gonna count my dependent variable and my individual, right? So I want to know how many of each, each individual is using or used 
in these sociolinguistic interviews. All right, so I just ran, I just did a command enter uh, and you can, do a, you can do a run anywhere in, in this block of code, right? It just results on everything, on the, the same thing. Okay, so what did I get here? I got that a cork used 11 of that expressed. So you have the count of how many that expressed and that omitted you have for each individual. But I, I mentioned that I want to look at um, rates or percentage. To be able to do that, I also need to know how many uh, instances of verb complement clauses each person used, right? So the raw count is not really useful here. So what I'm gonna do instead of a count, I'm gonna change my count to group by, and I'm gonna add, and then I'm gonna add a summarize. Uh, you can, uh, you're gonna see me using summarize with an S, uh, the Z version works the same way. You choose, I can keep with a Z. Um, so I'm gonna do is just uh, replicate with which what I already had, which is just the count. So to get this n, uh, I do in my summarize, I just do my n, which is my count, just do a count. So this n is a function that, that does the same thing as count, right? So I just, I'm showing you a different way of doing count. So we can actually add more stuff to calculate percentage. I'm gonna run this to show you is exactly the same thing as I had before, no changes. So I group by my, my variables and I summarize with a count is the same thing as count. But like I mentioned, I want more than just uh, the count. I also want the, I also want the, the total. And I think I inverted the way, yeah. I'm deciding if I'm gonna tell you about the individual, the order of course or not. Yes, the column names are, everything is case sensitive in uh, most programming languages. So if you do like individual with a for case here, it's not gonna work because it's not gonna find this way. So let me just continue doing this. So now that I have the, the group by summarize, I'm gonna use a mutate to calculate the total. So the total is gonna be my sum of this n. Do you have a group by for the Donson? You, you have to have a group by pipe summarize for you to get those two. It sounds like you don't have the group by. So if I, let me comment out my group by. So if I do this, I get, let me comment out this. So if I do this, I get this, but you shouldn't get 62 though. So you have to, whenever you get an error, um, you have to copy and paste what you entered and your error. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so let me run this. So what I did here was, I group by to do my count uh, to get how many individuals use how many of that express and that omitted. I calculated my n and then I'm calculating my sum, my total. But my total is by whatever is my first variable here. I'm calculating that I have 395 of that expressed. I actually don't do that. I want to do that. I want to do total per individual. So I'm going to switch the order. Oops, I, I ate one of the D. I'm gonna put in my group by individual first because that's where my total is gonna be by, by individual and then dependent variable second. So when I run this, I get what I want, which is for each individual, I have the two variables that express and that omitted. And then I can see a cork um, has 11 of the, total of 32, so A Corp used 32 verb complement clauses during their interview, social linguistic interview with Tagliamonte. From those 32 verb, uh, verb complement clauses, in 11 of them, 
they express the that. In 21 of them, they omitted that. So basically that's how I'm gonna get the rate of, uh, of omission per, per individual. So that's what this mutate is doing. The mutate is calculating the sum of n by the first variable you have in your group by. Thank you, my assistants. Yeah, it should be. So uh, it should be summarized with a. Um, right. So now that I have calculated the total, I can do n divided by total to get my, my rate or my percentage. So I'm going to do rate omission rate, maybe. You can decide whatever you want to call it, right? I'm going to do omission rate. It's going to be my n divided by my total and divided by total. So let's see what we got here. So for a cork again, which is the first person here, it's seeing they're in this, in these interviews, they use 65% of their verb complement clauses had that omitted 34. So 66, 34, they had that expressed. So um, many times when people are, maybe they collected the data, they have a tendency to think that they should, what they should produce on an Excel file is these counts. Again, let me repeat myself. You can get, get the counts from the single observations. So whenever you have like, you're coding your, your you're trying to extract how many verb complement causes from uh, your texts. Uh, in this case, they are scripts from transcripts from social linguistic interviews. Just note down each instance of that construction because you can always get um, the counts from this raw data, but you cannot get the individual instances from the counts data. So again, if you don't type what you entered. I cannot read your, I don't know what your, why your error is that. So type, copy and paste your actual, what you entered your code. Cause it could be that you forgot this pipe. That's probably it, that you don't have the pipe when you did. But if you don't uh, enter, if you don't tell me in the chat what you, your code actually is, it's gonna be hard for me to actually know. All right, so now we have this um, omission rate, right? And I mentioned that I want just that omitted. So I'm, I don't need that expressed because I have the rate already, right? So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna add a filter or to keep my dependent variable equals, you need two equal signs for comparison. So this equal sign here in the middle is just a, an assignment uh, and this is a comparison. So I'm gonna keep my dependent variable just that omitted and I'm gonna copy from whatever I have here because typing is hard. <laughs> uh, so that I don't have a double line for each one of my participants, because I'm just interested in knowing the omission rate anyways. So if I run this, I'm gonna have just the 32 participants. So one observation per participant where I have this omission rate um, per participant. Um, and then I have like how many, so it's like 21 out of 32. And I, I also have here uh, how many total uh, verb complement causes they had. So, all right, great. But I still need to add that individual information about sex, the age group, the occupation and the education to be able to do an analysis by occupation or by education, right? Um, so I need to, to add this individual data to these results. To do that, I'm gonna add a pipe. I'm gonna do a left join and just add this individual data my individual data. So basically now I'm gonna add all these information, uh, all these variables for each one of these individuals to my results. So I'm gonna run this. 
And you're going to see that in addition to the my individual, my dependent variable, my omission rate, and now I have sex, age, and so on. That looks good. But this is like I've been printing only to the console. I actually have to make an object that holds all of these, right? So I'm going to make a data frame. So to do that in the beginning of my block that I've been running and building, I'm going to add a new name. So I'm going to assign this, all of these calculations, to a new object. And I'm going to call this object, you can call it whatever you want. I'm going to say percent omitted by individual. So the, you need the pipe, so because this is your data, and then you pipe into the group by. So you need the pipe to link all of these functions together. So yes, you're always going to need a pipe with a data frame before I group by. Because this means get my data and then group the variables in this data, individual dependence variable, and then count how many of each, and then mutate, and then filter, and then join, right? So you need to start with the data always, use pipe, and then group by. Hope that answers the question. Okay, so I'm gonna save this object. And now you're going to see that in my global environment. OK, so if you just got a joining by individual, that's not an error. It's just a message. It's just telling you, oh, wait, has group output value? You can add really a missing for a group. Yes, you're good. These are just all, like, yes, I know, R sometimes. And sometimes it's red, so it's scary. <laughs> but these are all just, it's just R telling you what it's doing, but it worked. Um, so now that I actually assigned all of these to my percent omit individual, I have this percent omit individual in my global environment and I can click on it and inspect it, right? So as you see, I can have my individual, I have, well, dependent variable is kind of repeated. I don't need this because I remember that I just kept that omitted. Uh, I have the in. Uh, the total, the omission rate, the sex, the age, the occupation, and the education, right? So now I can do some visualizations. Um, and I'm going to take a break in like five minutes or 10 minutes. But let's do this visualization before. Um, so know that, like, I, it, it seems like a lot of steps, right? And it has a lot of steps, uh, but it's, again, it's not, once you, you are used to doing this, it's much easier, I'm gonna repeat myself, to get these counts and these uh, rates or, or percentages if you have your data, one observation, uh, one instance of data structure per, uh, row. So it's much, it, you can always get this type of uh, calculation of rate and counts from the raw data, but you never can get the raw data from the counts, right? Because often like when people want my help, they have these counts, like I cannot do that. And it's like, you need, you need the raw data. Anyways, so let's, now that we have this object, we can visualize some uh, some relationships. So Let's start with, um, we have all these different groups, right? Now we can do, we can look at sex, we can look at age, we can look at occupation. So basically we want to see, the question is, does one group have a higher rate of omission for that uh, complementizers in verb complement clauses than other groups? Um, so let's start with occupation. So my question is, what is the distribution of that zero complement zero that complementizer? Zero is a commission rate, that complementizer across occupation. Oops, my line is a little it went over. Let me do let me do a break line and another pound sign. Okay, so that's my question. So let's look at this. So I'm going to start with the data that I just calculated all the missions 
rate by participant. So I'm going to start with this percent omit individual. It's there, so that means that I have it in my global environment. I'm going to hit tab for autocomplete. And what I want to look at, so I'm going to do is like, you can also to look at your, your variables, your column names. You can click on this little blue button to open this up. So I want to look at occupation. So OCC is my variable. So I'm going to group by my, um, my categorical variable, occupation. And because I have, I have 32 participants split into two types of occupation, right? So I want to um, do a summarize. I typed the Z now. I want to, to calculate mean omission of all participants per occupation. And to do that, I'm going to do the mean of the omission rate, which I called omission rate. Right. So I'm getting all my participants. I'm grouping by them by occupation, and I'm calculating what's the mean of the omission rate over all these participants. If I run this, I'm going to get a table that tells me that blue collar workers have a higher omission, it seems, than white collar workers. Um, I can visualize this instead of a table. I can plot it with DigiPlot. So you're going to, I always use DigiPlot. And then for DigiPlot, the first thing you do is to specify your aesthetics, AES, or your mapping. I'm going to map, usually you map your categorical variable to X and your numeric variable to Y. So my X is going to be my occupation, which is the variable I have in my group by. So usually you map to X whatever you have in group by. And my Y? I'm going to map to the variable I created in summarize mean omission. So that's the first part of the digit plot. And I'm going to add a plus, not a pipe. It's very confusing. I often make that mistake. And then I'm going to do a gem call, which is going to draw a bar plot. I'm going to run this, and I get a bar plot, which shows me that the bar for blue color is higher than the bar for white collar. That means that the rate of omission of VAT complementizers in ver verb complement causes seems to be higher for blue collar workers than white collar workers. Uh, I also like to add a label, so I can do that. A plus geom label. For geom label, uh, I have to specify another mapping is not only X and Y. I have to say that my label equals also mean of emission. So it's like redundant here, uh, but I do think that it looks better if I have a label. Oh, my label is kind of like crazy because it has all of these, how many decimal point numbers after decimal point. So let's round this up to, so I have these three close parentheses. I'm gonna say digits, I'm gonna do two digits Two digits? Sure. Um, so I'm going to round my mean omission to display my label, showing only two digits. And this looks better. All right. So I make sure you can see my code and you can see my plot. Um, oh, and just note, right, I'm clicking on the zoom here to pop my plot out. So this is the rate of omission. So the mean rate of omission of that complementizers for across two groups of occupations. And, and this confirms a lot of re previous research that it seems blue collars, blue collar work, blue collar workers um, have a tendency to not do the, the standard, and they do standard because there is no such thing, right? Uh, but they omit. The complementizer more often than uh, white collar workers. Um, let's uh, let me show you how to actually do with the two of visualization with two of variables before we go. Uh, we do a five minute break. So I'm doing just occupation. So let's do occupation instead of just doing occupation. I'm going to do sex and occupation. 
So basically, I'll have a group by with two variables. So let's do that. So let me copy this question. So I want to say, what is the distribution of zero complementizer across occupation and sex? So I'm going to start with my same data, right? Because that's where I have all my percentages for individual. I'm going to group by this time my two categorical variables, so my two factor groups, whatever you call them. Uh, so occupation, oops, OCC, and sex. I'm going to do the same thing as I did before. I'm going to do a summarize of mean omission. I have multiple participants across these two groups. And it's going to be the mean of the variable that I have in my data, which is omission rate. So I'm going to just run these three lines. So I get the percentages. But visualizing things makes like better than visualizing, trying to understand this table. So I'm going to add a digit plot where I'm going to map to my x one of my um, one of my categorical variables, and I have two. So I'm gonna do. I can do. I can choose sex or occupation. I'm gonna do x equals occupation, and then my y is gonna be my numeric variable, which in my case here is mean omission rate, which I just calculated with summarize. And then let's do the other categorical variable, which is sex, because now I have two um, in my color. So I have I'm mapping three elements in my visualization. I'm going to do a plus. And this time, I'm going to do a geom point um, because I want to see the points. Bars is going to be a little harder to see. So I'm going to do a geom point first. So I'm going to run this. I get the two points. Um, for blue collar workers and white collars. I want lines to connect them because lines are easier to see. So I'm gonna do a geom line. I'm gonna add, there is a plus there, add a geom line. And for a geom line, I need to specify the group. So after my color, I'm gonna do a comma in my mapping, my aesthetics. I'm gonna do group equals sex. So usually your group for your line is gonna be the same at whatever color you're using, right? So I'm just indicating that the lines need to be connected using the same color. So that's my group. So when I run this, I see that, remember that the, the same pattern is kind of true here. Blue collar have a higher uh, omission rate of that complementizers in verb component clauses for blue collar workers and lower for white collar workers. And the two lines seem to be parallel, right? So that means that females, um, they have a higher rate of omission for both blue collar workers and white collar workers. So this means that um, sex seems to have the same effect across the different levels of occupation. So parallel lines, same effect. That means probably no interaction. So there is no interaction uh, between sex and occupation, right? So that means that the effect of sex is the same no matter the occupation. After the break, we're going to take a five-minute break. Um, I'm going to show you two different, two other variables here that actually interact, probably uh, because they cross. So let's take a five minute break, come back at 10.05. Okay, so we are in different time zones. So five minutes after the hour. I'll see you in five minutes. So as, uh, you can take a break, but um, how long is the workshop? Two hours. Uh, so we have one more hour, hour to go. Yes, it's, I like tidyverse because you can do pipe something else, pipe something else. To me, that's in my way of thinking, I do like 
the, so the group by and summarize, and then I add the gplot. I, that's why I like tidyverse. Do we have to tag our files in order to work that, with us? Uh, no. So this, okay. So this is the data, right? No, sorry. This is the original data. This was coded by hand, right? Probably by one of the graduate students, Dr. Clemente. So you should. So Sally Clemente is an amazing uh, researcher. She is a social Dr. Um, um Sorry, I typed this to a direct message. Um, she's a social linguist. So what happens is that in social linguistics, and I, again, I highly recommend you read uh, the book. You have this social linguistic interview. So the corpus is a set of trans transcripts from interviews. And then what you do is that by hand, usually, I've done automatic extraction of some of these tokens. You look for every instance of a complement, a verb complement clause, then you write it down. And then you say, you write down, usually in an Excel file, who is in the individual? What's the tense of the, the matrix clause? Is there anything between the verb and the that complementizer? So usually people do this by hand. I have, I just answered the question about how long this, there is one more hour. Yeah, no, that's okay. I just, I'm just saying that um, usually like a lot of, if you are in corpus linguistics or applied linguistics, maybe um, you're not familiar with the methods of sociolinguistics or language variation. So this is just, you know, a good, and there is a link at the bottom of the, the materials uh, just to know how, how things. And um, in applied linguistics, I mean, Stefan Gries does this, he uses a lot of regression where he looks about what is the, what did he use? Like, was it like, um, now I don't remember what the variable is, but you kind of code like what native speakers do, and then you code what uh, students or non-native speakers do, and then you compare. Okay. So whenever you get an error, Ali, if you can type, you can actually paste what you your code is. Otherwise, I can't really help you if I don't see what your code is. So for, is it like, is your, okay, so I have, I'm looking at it. So are you sure you have, it looks like you don't have a column. Whenever they say you could not find something, it might be that, did you call your column omission rate when you created it? So in your percent omit individual is this omission rate? All right, so in your global environment, there is a little arrow, a blue arrow right at, uh, next to percent omit individual. So if you click on that arrow, it's gonna open up all of the column names. See if you wrote omission rate like I did, maybe, you wrote it different. Like if you have uppercase, it has to be it match exactly whatever you use here. It has to match exactly what you have here. Before num, before n u n u m. Okay, that's fine. It doesn't matter. You can just, just make sure that you're typing whatever you have here, you type this exactly the same. So you have num, so you have, I don't know what to say. Oh, okay, omission percent, okay. I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can we make the program compare scripting? I don't know what that means. You can unmute yourself if you want to explain to me. Or yes, you can compare. That's what we're doing, right? You can compare as long as you have the data. So here we have 
like when we did the omission right, rate. It's basically what we're doing by individual, right? So it looks like, uh, so A Cork has a 66% omission, B Hamilton has a 92 omission, right? So I'm comparing, I, in a way I have information from all 32 speakers. So I know in comparison, so I can actually, actually click on omission rate to see who has the lowest omission rate is this seventh person. Uh, it's an older female, white color, and she has more than minimum age um, education. If I click on it again, I see the highest omission. This person, which is a younger female, she's 23, she's a blue collar worker. She has a hundred percent omission. All of her verb complement clauses, she never used that. I, Adria, I have a yes. question. Uh -huh. So I got the plot, um, but there is no line connecting the dots. So do you think I missed something in my? Do you have this plus line and you have group equals sex? Oh, I see. OK. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know why it makes it specify group sex, because my group is always my color. I don't know why he doesn't figure it out that, but you have to be explicit. All right. Um, so we did before the break, or some of you who took the break, we did blue collar versus white collar across sex. And I told you the lines are parallel. So there is no, it seems that there is no interaction. We don't know, we had to run uh, ANOVA or we're gonna run linear regression to see whether that's actually true. But from the descriptive statistic or the, the visualization, it seems there is no interaction. So let's look at something that has an interaction. I know because already when I read, um, I read uh, Doug Ramon's book and I've done this before. So we're going to look at it's occupation, sex, and education. So we're going to do this exactly the same thing, but instead of doing occupation, sex, we're going to do education and sex. So across education and sex. Uh, we start with our data, which is the percent omit individual. And then I'm gonna group by our two variables, so our two factor groups. In this case, we're doing education, which is just a do. Right, let me. So it's just a do here. So it's a do comma sex. Uh, and then we're going to do the same summarize where we do mean omission, where we calculate for all the 32 participants, we calculate the mean of uh, I call it here omission rate. So I'm gonna run these three lines. So I have the education, the sex, and the mean omission. Um, let's visualize it because it's just easier to see interactions by visualizations. Uh, so we're going to do a digit plot where I specify my aesthetics. I'm going to map my X to education, my Y to the numeric variable, which is mean omission, which I just created again with my summarize. Let's do color equals sex, like we did before. And we know that I'm going to do a line, so I'm going to do a group equals sex as well. Exactly like we did before, but instead of having occupation, I have education. And do a plus, and I'm gonna do both a geom point plus geom line. Um, so I'm gonna run this. Before I talk about lines crossing, they do cross. Uh, one thing that is bothering me about this um, plot is that in my X, more than minimum age comes before to up to minimum age. And actually that order is inverted, right? Because I have first, I should have 
people who have up to high school. And then second, I should have people who have college degrees over, right? So this is not ordered the right way because this is ordered by alphabetic order. More M comes before up. So let me show you how to switch the order of these um, so that it makes more sense, right? Because looking at it, I think that this is the lower end of education. This is the higher, that is not true. So let me fix that. Let me put up to minimum age before more than minimum age. So to do that, before my plot, I'm gonna mutate. So I'm gonna change my education to be a factor with different levels. Uh, so it's gonna be factor of education. I'm gonna do a comma, and then I'm gonna do an enter just to make things a little easier to read. So I'm gonna change an education. I'm gonna change the order of the factor levels here. So I'm gonna determine my levels are gonna be equals, and then I'm gonna provide a list or a vector, which in R is always a C. C open and close parentheses. Then I'm gonna list the order I want and they have to match the names I have here, which is more uh, up to minimum age, more than minimum age. So two, so I need two, two levels, right? I'm gonna do, and they go between quotes. Um, quotes, yes. So I need two levels in the right order. So I'm just gonna copy and paste from here so I don't have to type it because I'm bound to type, to mistype here. So this is my first level up to minimum age. I just selected and copied. And I'm gonna go back to my script and put this in the first one Then go back to my data and do more than minimal age. I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna paste in the second one. So I'm inverting the order, right? I'm saying that up to minimum age is the first level, more than minimum age is the, the second level. I'm gonna do a pipe at the end of this, and then the order is gonna be inverted. Um, I'll answer the question in the chat in a minute. So, right, so I inverted the order because they were not in the correct order and that's not great. Is it, is it fixed? All right, yes. So now I have the lowest level of education on the left and the second level of education on the right. So every time you want to reorder your levels, you do this mutate factor levels. Okay, so the lines different from what we had before where the lines were parallel, indicating that the effect of sex was the same across occupation, here the lines cross. That means there is a, might be an interaction uh, where sex has a different effect across education levels. So up to minimal age or up to high school, males have a higher rate, it seems, of omission of that complementizers and verb complement clauses than women or females. Uh, but for people with more than minimal age, so more than high school, like maybe uh, a college or graduate school uh, degree, that order inverts. So for that level of education, females have a higher rate of omission than men. Um, so visualizing rates like this before you run your regression uh, is really helpful for, helpful for you to try to guess which interactions you have to enter in your, your model. So it seems like sex and education is a type of interaction that I would be interested in um, because the lines cross. So that's an easy way to like to remember interaction. Uh, if the lines are parallel, probably no interaction. If the lines cross, probable interaction. So the question is, how do you change the numbers, right? So because in my plot, the number starts at 0.77, right? And that's a good point. So because it doesn't start at zero, because my range of emission is between zero and one. That's like, that's I always talk about that with my students. So this seems like a huge difference, right? Because my scale is very small. So let's change this as suggested. Let's make this from the actual whole range from zero to one. To do that, 
at the, you can do that at the end of a plot. You add a plus, and then you specify your y limits, y lim. And I want to do from zero to one. Now the difference seems so much smaller. <laughs> this is a lesson on how to manipulate your plots to show like these huge differences. <laughs> and we're gonna run the logistic regression. So notice that now that I go from zero to one, of course, the lines are not as drastically different. Um, oh, Excel, yeah, if you are great on using Excel, Good for you. Like I admire people who can use Excel, but. <laughs> um, all right. And then if you want, let me just look at the time. You can also change all these labels, right? So I can do, just let me show you. You can do labs. Let's say my Y, my X is education. My Y is mean omission rate. I can do main that omission rate, I guess. And can I can add a title? Um, I can say distribution of that omission. I can add a subtitle uh, across education and a sex. And I can add a caption data from. Um, Ugly Monte, I think it's 2009. Right, so your labs, your labs, your labels, you can do all that. So I changed the X, the Y, the title, the subtitle, and an edit a caption. That looks a little better. Um, so I added all these labels with labs. Uh, personally, I also like to add a theme. Let's do line draw, I guess. Let's try that one. Yes, uh, you can use citations. Um, you can certainly do that. Uh, you, you would have to use R markdown. I think I may have materials that. So you to do citations and use markdown with a dot bit file and you can certainly do that all right um so let's move on to um the linear regression so far it's we've been using descriptive statistics by right? kind of visualizing exploring the data trying to figure out where the interactions are and where the uh, correlations are seems like we don't have correlations uh, and you know, because you know, again, I'm replicating a study by Tagle Monte. Uh, it does seem that sex and education might have an interaction. Um, so let's check with linear regression. So my dependent variable here, let me go to again, I'm gonna open percent omitted. Um so because it's linear regression, I need a continuous numeric variable, which I do have. It's on my omission rate, right? So my omission rent rate here is going to be my dependent variable. And then my predictors are going to be sex, age, age group. Actually, I'm not going to run with this. I'm going to replicate what Dr. Monte did. So I'm going to uh, run these groups, um, occupation and education. And it seems, let's check the if there is an interaction between education and sex, because they seem that the lines crossed, right? So let's do that. So I'm gonna do this the way, the tidyverse way. You might, you've probably seen this if you've used uh, regression before in a different way, but this, this is the way I like doing it. Because again, I can chain things up and eventually visualize them. So I'm gonna start with my data which is the percent omit individual. And then I'm gonna run linear regression and I'm gonna specify my formula. So like I said, my formula is gonna be the omission rate 
and I know that I just realized that I did I did call percent this variable percent in the materials. That's my, my, why my, you might have different names. But in my data, um, the the a dependent variable is the omission rate, right? This is what I want to say. Like, what is the effect of all of these different things on emission rate? Um, so emission rate phi. So you do use the tilde, which is doing my escape key in my keyboard. So I want to see emission rate by sex. So what's the effect of sex on emission rate? Uh, my age group, age three way. Uh, occupation, what's the effect of occupation on emission rate? Uh, education, uh, and I believe, according to my visualizations, that there might be a interaction of education and sex. So let's check that as well. Uh, so this is my formula. So I start with my data, and then I pipe the data into my my linear regression with this formula, which is I'm looking at the effect of sex, age, occupation, education and the interaction between education and sex into my omission rate. I'm gonna add a pipe here at the end and do a summary because that's how you get the results of a, of a regression. No, uh, so overleaf is LaTeX. Uh, oh yeah, like, like similarly way, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking at the chat. Yes, so yes, it's similar to LaTeX is what you do in, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so if, when I run this, I get my results in my console. So let me make this a little bigger so we can look at it. So my question for you here, while we look at the results, is like, how do we interpret this? What factors are significant? And is the interaction between education and sex actually significant? You can enter your, your answers, I guess, in the chat, or you can just think about it. So from out, my first question is, all right, if you ran into an error, type what you entered and what error you got. What's the error? So Stefano, if you can enter the error you got, might be able to help yeah. you. It says that um, the argument object is not specified. I'm looking at again at your in factor object. All right. So the question I have is whether you're running. So if you do session info, do you have? R 4.0 something. Because that's a, it sounds like an error that maybe uh, that you don't have. Uh, 4.01. Oh. Arrowing factor object. I really don't know, sorry. So try for people who got the error. Try to this the regular way. Model one equals lm a data. So formula. So you can do just the formula. And then you specify the data. And then you do summary of this model. I should run this way. I don't see why it would be uh, different. I, so why don't you try to run that way? Let's see. So yeah, somebody answered. So the only factor, the only significant predictor is occupation, which predicts less emission. Yes. So, <coughs> excuse me. So if you go by the significance, uh, so p value below uh, the alpha of 0 0.05, it seems that in relationship, to the intercept, which is blue color, occupation is significant. So white color has a lower, um, a lower 
rate of emission compared to blue collar workers. Um, so blue female, middle age, um, more than minimum age, have a rate of emission of 82%. White collar workers have 13% lower than that. Uh, if you want more explanation on how to read this, I have a whole blog post about it. But what I'm going to show you how to do it is actually to plot the occupation effect, which it seems to be the only significant factor here. Uh, so to do that, uh, so uh, Marina and who else got the error? Stefano. If you do this instead, do you get an error? And we you can we can do just occupation. Let's do that. So let's save this uh, regression model. So I'm gonna create an object with I'm gonna run regression again, but I'm gonna do just by occupation because it seems to be the only one that's significant. I'm going to specify my data as percent omit. So I'm going to run this. If I run summary, of course I get the same result because you know it's the same data. So I have only occupation uh, is a significant social factor here. Let me know if this works instead. So once we have this model saved, um, we can do effect. If you don't have effect auto completing here, that means you didn't run, you didn't load the library effects here at the top. So make sure you run library effects. I think I think the problem is Matilda actually. I think that it, because when I type it in, uh, it doesn't become gray. So I don't think it's it, it uh, recognizes it as a function. So. Let me copy and paste my tilde because there are two tilde characters. And depending on the yeah, keyboard exactly. you're I think using. I'm going to put in the wrong one. <laughs> I, I know. Oh, okay. Yes, that's a good point. So make sure maybe copy and paste the tilde. So if you're, yes, that's a good point. So if you're using a uh, keyboard with, uh, I'm from Brazil, so we do have. So if you're using a keyboard with a different, let me show you. There are two tilde. Okay, it's working now. <laughs> nice, nice to know. Yeah, but like for some keyboards, there are two tilde characters. One that is just a uh, separate character and one that goes over the N. Those are different characters. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, that's good to know. Now I know in the future. It is a, yeah, it's a Unicode interest. All right, so now that, uh, so if you do, but we do want to save this model, just the linear regression of omission rate by occupation. Because it seems to be, and that's what Dagmar Monti found, that only occupation is the significant factor here, I think. <laughs> and uh, so if we save it in a model, we can actually plot the effect. So between quotes, you do effect, between quotes, you do occupation, because that's the effect you want to look at. And then you do model one. Uh, so this will give you the effect. So if I run this, just this, it's gonna give me the effect of blue collar and white collar. So you're gonna see that these numbers are different from whenever you do summary. So in summary, oh, in this case, I just have, it's kind of like, yeah. So this number is blue collar is 87 and then white collar is 10 points or 11 points lower, right? When you run effects, the effect of occupation on model one, it gives you those, it gives you those two percentages or probabilities, now they're probabilities. And I know that they are um, significant according to my linear regression. I'm gonna add a pipe at the end of this and I'm gonna say this, show me, show me this as an actual data frame. When I do this, when I add data frame to my effect, I get, not only the fit, so the fit is basically the mean, right? The estimated mean. So I get the same, of course, the same estimated mean, 87% uh, percent of emission for blue collar workers, 76% of emission by taught color, white collar workers. When, when I add this data frame here, this five data frame, I also get 95% confidence intervals. 
which is many ways in many publications preferable to just the p-value. Uh, so we can actually plot that this with bar error bars showing the confidence intervals. So here I'm looking at the fact of occupation levels. Uh, so this is like the mean, right? The mean probability of omission of that. Uh, I have the standard error, the lower uh, interval and the upper interval. Let's plot this. I'm gonna do a ggplot. I'm gonna add a ggplot to it. And then um, I'm gonna do kind of same, similar to what I did before. My x here is gonna be my, uh, my levels, all right? My categorical variable, which is occupation. So I'm gonna specify the aesthetics, the x equals occupation. My y is gonna be my rate or my probability or my mean, which in, my, in this is fit. That's the, what the model fit. Um, all right, so let's do this for now. I'm gonna do a geom point. So this is gonna give me the two points and we can do the zero to one to make sure this is good. But this is just the mean, right? Which is very similar to what we got before. Uh, blue collar workers have a higher rate of omission, almost 87%. 87% probability um, and white color workers have a lower percent probability. And if you don't, Ali, you have to enter what you, your code, otherwise I can't really see what the, the error is. Um, so let's add the error bars, the confidence intervals. So to do that, I'm gonna do geom error bar. So for this, I have to specify my lower and my upper, which I have here on my data. So I'm gonna do my aesthetics again. I'm gonna specify my Y minimum is equals my lower in my data, right? So I have the lower here. I'm gonna do a comma, a Y max. My Y maximum is my upper. So that gives me uh, the confidence intervals. And as we can see here, does they overlap by a bit? Um, you have an extra, Marina, you have an extra parenthesis after age three way. Yeah, so there is, I don't, okay. People asking for, for a certificate, just fill out the survey at the end of this and fill out the survey and then I'll be able to send you a certificate. It seems like some people missed this step here. So in order to get this effect here, you have to create this object. And then run this. So let's look at the, this. So now I have in addition, so what the linear regression model gives me is in addition of the, the mean percentage, which we calculated before and we plot this before with the bars, um, I can go back to, to show you where. So it was the first plot we created, I believe, by occupation, I think is this one, right? So when we plot, when you calculated uh, omission rate, and with the this plot bar, we got 87% of omission for blue collar workers and 76% omission for white collar workers, right? So the results for the linear regression, of course, are gonna be the same. They should be different. And let me add that geom label here so I can actually show you. So I'm gonna add the label here. My label is gonna be a, round, uh, a rounded up fit with two digits. But I add a plus. Um, let me do, sorry, I'm like, let me do my geom label after my bars because my bars are on the front of my geom label. Okay, so we got the exact same numbers, which is good. We shouldn't get something that is different. Um, so I do have the book workers are 
have a, a probability of omitting the that in verb complement clauses at 87%, while eight color is also 76. But now I have the error bars and I can say from my regression that the behavior of these two groups is actually different, significantly different. Um, I don't, so Marina, maybe I'll, I'll copy and paste what I have because I, I'm confused by what you have there. So this is what it should be. Oops, no, let me see. Everyone, <laughs> not letting me put in the chat. So your motto doesn't seem to be, so this is what it is. Um, all right, so just to clarify, so we're, we're now, these visualization, this visualization is from our actual linear regression. And the reason the question when we do summary is that, that um, this is uh, occupation of white collar in comparison to blue collar is different, it's significantly different. Um, and if I do the effect of the model with the day and frame, I'm just selecting these two lines. Uh, in addition to the spit, I also get the confidence intervals, which I can then do a digiplot of and actually show that the confidence intervals don't really overlap. So they are different. Um, let's do, I'm gonna show you how to do this again, but with, um, with a linguistic variable. Yes, this can be a bar, uh, a bar. Yes, it can be a bar plot. So to do a bar plot, I do this as a call, and that should be enough. That's all you need to do. Instead of doing a jump point, do a jump call, and then you have a bar plot. And also, I will probably do like this uh, width of the arrow bar a little. I will do width equals point two to make the bars a little not as um they are hidden now behind the <laughs> but this is probably better yes and again right with this with jump bar you get from zero to so actually the differences are not so great always keep in mind the scale Okay, so I'm gonna run this again, but instead of using occupation, let's do one of the linguistic variables, which is verb. Uh, so the question is, what is the distribution of omission rate of that across of verbs, lots of verbs in the matrix uh, clause? Right, so I think that uh, I know that, right? So that verb that actually controls the complement clause. All right, so verb is not really in this data that we've been using, right? So we've been using this percent on mid individual. So we're going to go back to our raw data. So we're going to use the complement that data. And we're going to do all the steps that we did so far, but with the individual data. We're going to, oh, maybe we should just run. I'm thinking, wait, should I just run linear regression? Um, no, let's do the whole thing. Okay, we have time. So we start with the raw data because now again, we're using it, looking at the linguistic variable. So we're going to start with complement that data. Uh, and then let me give me some space here. What we have to do is remember that we did with the individual data, we did group by summarize to calculate the percentage of emission per individual. So in this case, we want to calculate the percentage of emission per verb, lexical verb in the matrix uh, clause. So we're going to do the same thing as we did before. We're going to do with group by, but we want to look at verb and my dependent variable. 
just like we did it before. But before we did, um, we did individual independent variable, right? Now I'm looking at verb. Um, I'm going to do my summarize where I calculated my n, which basically gives me the count of, I know, like here, no for that expressed, there are 44 instances, no for that omitted at 92 emissions, and so on. Oh, sorry, yeah. And now we're going to calculate the mutate to calculate the total and the percentage. My total is the sum of my n, like we did before. My omission rate is my n divided by total. So again, I'm just going over all the steps we did so far, but instead of using individual, I'm using verb. So now I have no for that expressed and that omitted, and I have the omission rate for no omitted at 60, 68%. Um, I'm interested just in that omitted, so I'm gonna filter my dependent variable dependent variable, here it is, equals two equal signs that omitted. So I keep just one line per, um, per verb. Because it's not percent, I think it's omitted rate. Omission rate, I think. So now that we have this, we can visualize it. I'm going to do a ggplot. I'm going to add a ggplot to it. I'm going to do the statics. My x is going to be my categorical variable, which is my verb. My y is going to be my numeric variable, which is my omission rate. Oops, I have to spell it right. All right, so this one has to match this one. Um, I'm going to do a gym column. And let me add a geom label to already because I always do that. And then my aesthetics is going to be my label is going to be my rounded omission rate uh, with two digits. These are all the steps we've done before, but I'll combine. We do a group by for verb, dependent variable to calculate how many of each we have. Then we calculate the total and the omission rate. You can see my screen, right? I got a like a mess, a weird message. And then we plot it with the verb in the x axis, the omission rate in the y, and it's a column with a label at the top. Okay, so it seems that think has, when whatever you have think as in the main clause, uh, there is a higher rate of omission. Um, and say other and no, uh, I don't know, I don't know if these two are different actually, but they don't have that omitted as frequently as the verb think. We can actually check this with linear regression. So let's do that. I'm gonna do my model verb, which is a linear regression of my, oh yes, I have to save this, my obisha rate. I'm looking at time and I'm thinking if we do, should we do a, uh, sorry, I'm thinking, all right. So I need to save this as an object to actually be able to calculate uh, run linear regression on it, right? Because I want my dependent variable to be the omission rate, which would like exactly what we did before. So you can do the same thing as we did before, but instead of having um, the model be omission rate by occupation, then you can do omission rate by verb. But because I only have 15 minutes, let me show you how to actually run logistic regression. It's linguistic variables. Because um, 
for logistic regression, you don't need to do that summary. You don't need to calculate the emission rate because the original data frame, because we have one observation, one occurrence of each uh, verb complement cause per line, we already have that binary variable. So the difference between linear regression and logistic regression basically is that linear regression, you need a numeric, continuous numeric dependent variable like omission rate, uh, which goes from zero to one uh, in this case. And for logistic regression, you have a binary variable, um, which is zero or one, which I have here in my data because I have omission or express. So I have this uh, dependent variable numeric that I can use for my logistic regression. So no need to do any group by summary. You can just run directly on it. So I'm gonna do model two here for my logistic regression. Uh, for the logistic regression, instead of LM, you're gonna uh, run a generalized linear model. Uh, my formula is gonna be my, de my dependent variable numeric, and it has to be zero one. I cannot run this on dependent variable. It has to be the numeric one. By, um, so let's do, you can run all of it because all of these are actually included in Taglemonte's model. But let's do verb, let's just do verb. You can do, of course, like we did before, plus uh, and all the other things. So let's just do the factor verb on my dependent variable. And my data is actually going to be my original data, my raw data, which is complement that class. So that's all I need to do. No group by, no summarize, no anything. You can use complement that across the data, the raw data. Just specify that uh, your response variable uh, is the dependent numeric variable, which is zero, one. And in this case, the only predictor or the only factor group we're gonna use is verb in the matrix class. I'm gonna run this, I'll run a summary on this model. And I see that in many ways, the summary is similar, but very different from, um, from, the linear regression. These are in log odds. Uh, you can convert these log odds to probabilities. Uh, it's very easy to do. I have a blog post about this. But here my intercept is no. So what's saying here is that other and say is not really different than no. So they basically are all the same. There's no significance uh, in, the, in the differences here. 68, 61, and 75, but think is significantly different from no, right? So my intercept here is my no. Um, now that I have my model, I can do exactly the same thing as did before. I can do the effect of verb. So verb is my predictor for model two. So that gives me the exact same probabilities as I had here, right, again, this shouldn't be a surprise because it's all the same data. You shouldn't get different results from the descriptive statistics to the model fit. I'm gonna add a data frame here to get, in addition to the mean or the fit, I'm also gonna get the standard error, the lower and the upper limits of my confidence intervals. And then by doing that, I can do a DT plot where I specify my mapping X to verb, my Y to my fit, which is just my mean omission rate like we did before. Uh, let's do a bar again, add the geom error bars to it. I specify another mapping of my Y minimum is my lower in my data. I put the right place. <laughs> All right, my Y minimum is my lower. My Y maximum is my upper. And let's add that label because I like it. Another uh, mapping, my label equals my fit, but I want to round it. Again, we did this before. So we round the fit 
for two digits. Uh, professor? Yes. Is it supposed to be x equals verb there? No, yeah, I got the error. Right, I have an extra v. So let's look at this. So this is not really much difference, different than what I had before, right? If I can get my plots. Right, this is very similar to my latest plot. But now I have the error bars, and this is coming from the logistic uh, logistic regression. Let me do the width here as 0.2, so it's not S. All right, so what my logistic regression tells me, I can't even see the error bars here. Maybe I should, sorry, I'm like, the label is on the top of the error bars. So let me, all right, I can fix that by doing a vertical adjustment. That is what it is. Yeah, let's do two. So I'm trying to move my labels down. All right. So I can see my error bars because they're so tight around the mean that it's hard to see. So what my model, my logistic model said is that think is different than no. I can see a uh, significant later frame, right? I can see that my confidence intervals do not overlap with the no confidence intervals, but that other and say are not really significantly different than no, right? And we do see that their confidence intervals overlap. Um, I know it was a lot. I will share the uh, the recording for this. Just wanted to remind you that all of this and with descriptions is in my materials. So I run over, I go over all of this code. At the end of this, um, there are two other resources. There is another tutorial I wrote where I explain in more detail the formula, what and what linear regression and logistic regression is. There is a lot of things I didn't mention in this tutorial about um, mixed effects and things like that, but you can read in my uh, this blog post. Uh, I also added a link for Dagla Montes book. And if you could please fill out this short survey, there is a link here. Let me share this link with you. Uh, to let me know it's anonymous. Uh, if you want to be anonymous, you can just fill out the survey with what you thought of this workshop and what I can do better next time. Uh, if you need a um, certificate for this workshop, also in the survey, there is a question about that. I'm just gonna stop here. I know it was a lot, usually a lot. Uh, I have seven minutes for questions if you have any. Thank you for watching this video. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear from you in the comments. Please visit our website, writecrow.org, to learn more about the corpus and repository of writing, including links to other writing research resources we've built. Thanks again.